now and then you see an image from the Hubble Space Telescope that absolutely blows you away. And this month, we got just that with this image of what's been dubbed the Bullseye Galaxy, with nine, maybe even 10 rings of stars around it. Now in my research, I study the shapes of galaxies and I probably quite naively thought that I'd pretty much seen it all. And this was just a really nice reminder that the universe can always surprise us. Because we see lots of galaxies with rings, maybe even two rings or three rings. Some where the rings are a little bit messy and some where they're so perfectly aligned, it's hard to believe they're real. But we have never before seen a ring galaxy with more than three rings. That is until this galaxy, LEDA 1313424. And what's more is that Pasha and collaborators who actually reported this discovery were able to test our predictions for how these rings of stars form in galaxies when two galaxies collide. So in this video, we're gonna dive into all the details here. And we're gonna chat first about why we care about ring galaxies and what we can learn from them. Second, how this ring galaxy was found in the absolute haystack that is astronomy data. Third, how Pasha and collaborators used it to test our ideas about how rings form in galaxy collisions. And finally, how this discovery might solve the mystery of low surface brightness galaxies. And if you love deep dives like this into the big ideas in science, then you've got to check out Nautilus magazine, who are the sponsor of today's video. Nautilus covers stories that present ideas that will be debated long into the future, which is why Nautilus has established itself as the foremost literary scientist science magazine, and also my personal favourite science magazine as well. Some of those well-regarded scientific minds in the world read and write for Nautilus, including literary giants like the late Cormac McCarthy, who published the only non-fiction piece of his career in Nautilus, or senior scientists for astrobiology at NASA Ames Research Center, Caleb Scharf, who regularly contributes reflections on our place in the universe. Which is why I know all of you will particularly enjoy Nautilus's Cosmos section, which explores the science and philosophy of studying the universe, and does so with such a wonderful style with this merger of art, culture, science, and discovery. You can join as a digital-only member or in print to receive six beautifully illustrated, award-winning collectible editions that are the staple of any good scientist's home library. So join me in reading Nautilus in 2025 by heading to joinnautilus.com forward slash Dr. Becky and you'll get 15% off your membership. So big thanks to Nautilus for sponsoring this video. And now let's dive into why we even care about ring galaxies and what we can learn from them. So to be classed as a ring galaxy, a galaxy needs one or more rings of stars. Usually newly formed stars mean that the ring is very bright and very blue looking. But with that definition of a ring galaxy, you end up with a category of galaxies that is very broad. You end up with galaxies in that category of all shapes and sizes. You can have polar ring galaxies where the ring goes over the poles of the galaxy. You can have perfectly circular rings like Hoag's object or elliptical ring galaxies or off-center ring galaxies, inner rings and even pseudo rings. And like the spiral galaxies that we talked about a few weeks ago, there's not one single explanation that can explain how all of these different types of rings formed. People have suggested that rings can form at the end of bar structures in galaxies, with the bars forming stars in a ring as the end of the bar sweeps around. Then there's the idea that as a galaxy draws in fresh gas from the filaments of gas that make up the cosmic web, that you can form a ring. And then there's the idea that rings are formed in collisions of two galaxies, especially those that happen as head-on collisions. And the effect is like dropping a pebble into a pool. The ripples outwards cause gas in the galaxy to compact and form stars in the ripple or in a ring. Now that means that as well as being incredibly beautiful, ring galaxies can also be incredibly useful as probes of physics. So the polar rings, for example, are really useful for tracing how the matter in galaxies is distributed through the gravitational effects, especially any dark matter. So you can work out, okay, does it like extend beyond the disk in like a, just a disk shape? Or is this dark matter like a, a big sphere that the disk of the galaxy is like embedded in the center of? The dynamics of a polar ring can help you figure that out. 
Whereas the collisional ring galaxies that we think form from mergers of two galaxies are a very specific, like symmetric case of what happens in a merger. It helps you really sort of like narrow down the initial starting conditions that you had in the merger of the two galaxies without all the mess of like multiple passes of two objects and tidal tails that quite literally drag the process out. So ring galaxies are ideal laboratories for testing physics. The problem is they're quite rare, which brings me to the second part of this video. How Pasha and collaborators actually found this ring galaxy in the haystack of astronomical data? Well, like a lot of scientific discoveries, the bullseye galaxy was found completely serendipitously, like completely by accident. So the lead author of this paper, Imad Pasha, is a recently graduated PhD student from Yale. And they said that at the time they were looking at image data from a telescope on the ground that has done what's known as a survey. So literally night after night they've slowly built up an entire picture of the sky. And they said when they happened to spot this galaxy with multiple rings they were immediately drawn to it and had to stop to investigate it. And if you're wondering like how on earth, or how in the universe, this incredibly beautiful ring galaxy with such incredible structure like we've never seen before could have been missed in the sky for so long. Well, first of all, let me remind you how just insanely mind bogglingly big the entire sky actually is. And second of all, I wanna show you what this galaxy actually looked like in these previous surveys that had been taken from the ground. So the first big survey of the northern sky was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey using the 2.5 meter telescope at the Apache Point Observatory Kitt Peak in Arizona. And this bullseye galaxy in STSS looks like this. So fuzzy that it looks like it maybe has two rings, which, you know, is rare amongst the already rare ring galaxies, but nothing we haven't seen before. Since SDSS, its follow-up has been the Legacy Survey, which used the much bigger four meter Blanco telescope at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. A bigger telescope means a higher resolution, so you can see finer detail on the sky, and also you have more light collecting power, so you can see fainter objects. In the Legacy Survey, the Bullseye Galaxy looks like this. And this was the survey that the first author, Pasha, spotted this ring galaxy. One, two, three, maybe even four rings visible in the colour images. It's actually when you grab the raw data from the legacy survey and you start playing around with like the levels and like the contrast that you actually see there's maybe even seven rings that are visible in the legacy survey data. That is like nothing we'd ever seen before. And so Pasha and collaborators knew they'd need some follow-up data. They applied to use the Hubble Space Telescope to get an image because the authors knew they would need a space telescope to really confirm the structure of this object because going into space helps you remove that blurring effect of the Earth's atmosphere. And so you can get a much sharper image of what's going on, which is what revealed this incredible image of what Pasha and collaborators have dubbed this bullseye galaxy with eight visible rings. With so many rings, the only way that we know of that this galaxy could have formed is through a head-on collision with another galaxy, just like dropping the pebble in the pool. Which brings me to part three. How Pasha and collaborators used it to actually test our ideas about how rings form in galaxy collisions. So back in 2010, Strzok worked through the maths of what you'd expect these ripples to look like from a head-on collision of two galaxies and worked out how far apart each ring would be spaced as the energy rippled through the main galaxy. And it produced a very simple prediction that said that there should be a set ratio between the sizes or the radii of each successive ring, with the first ring being three times bigger than the second, the second being 1.67 times bigger than the third ring, the third being 1.4 times bigger than the fourth ring, and so on and so on. But it's hard to test this prediction if you don't have a galaxy with a load of rings that are really well resolved so you can sort of like have the crisp edges that help you work out where the radius actually is. So Strzok back in 2010 was just working with the limited number of double or triple ring objects that were known and observed with ground-based surveys that were very fuzzy, while also not knowing if there were rings further out from those galaxies that were fainter and so hadn't been detected in the ground-based surveys and so you couldn't even be sure what 
ring you were seeing was what number to compare the ratios to. But with so many rings detected in the bullseye galaxy in this Hubble Space Telescope image, you can do this test more accurately. So Pasha and collaborators first had to identify the rings and measure their radii, which is easier said than done because there is some variation in noise to take into account. But then once they had that, they could then compare all the sizes of their measured and detected rings and the ratios between them to what this model predicted for if they'd been formed in a collision. So that's what's plotted here. Their measured values for their rings that detected are on the y-axis and they're plotted against the radius that would be predicted on the x-axis. Now there's a little bit of a complication here because you don't actually know whether the outermost ring that you detected was actually the first ring, the first ripple caused in the collision. So there's a couple of different lines plotted here. First, the line that assumes that the outermost ring that you detect in the Hubble Space Telescope image was actually the first ring formed is shown by the blue line. Or if that outermost ring is the second ring, that's shown in the red. Or if it's the third, that's shown in black. If it's the fourth, it's in gray. Or if it's the fifth ring, it's in cyan. Now, if your measured points agreed with your predicted points, you'd get that dashed black line. And so you'll see that the black points are the ones that fit best with that dashed line, meaning the outermost ring detected in the Hubble images was the third ring formed in the system. And then the innermost ring was actually ring 10, making what appears to be an eight ring galaxy when you look at this image, more likely to be a 10 ring galaxy. But then that raises the question then, okay, are there two other rings beyond what you can see in the Hubble Space Telescope image that are then further out again? specifically at the radius that the theory would predict they'd be at. So 1.67 times the size of the outermost ring in the Hubble Space Telescope image. So then Pasha and collaborators got two more bits of follow-up data. First, using the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and then an even deeper image to detect the faintest of structures with the Dragonfly Array. Dragonfly is such a unique telescope, if you can even call it that. You know those huge zoom camera lenses that the paparazzi use to capture pictures of celebrities over a mile away? Well, they've actually been put to some good use now. With 48 of these lenses all strapped together to make a telescope that has enough light collecting power to detect the faintest of objects, like the faint light from gas and stars in between galaxies in big galaxy clusters, or from faint tidal streams of galaxies torn apart in collisions, or in this case, very faint rings. Because after subtracting for faint emission from gas in our galaxy known as Cirrus, which is in the foreground, Pasha and collaborators managed to spot a faint ring of emission at the predicted size. Now the next step was actually to detect if that very faint ring was actually at the same distance as the galaxy and therefore was actually associated with it rather than maybe being more emission in the foreground or in the background, which is what the spectra from Keck were for. And they were taken in that little white box that's drawn over the ring there. And it was found it was at the same distance. So this meant that the bullseye galaxy definitely had nine rings but possibly all of them were deceived because there could even be a 10th ring beyond that as well. With the Keck data, they also managed to figure out which galaxy was responsible for creating all these rings in the collision and found that this blue galaxy in the top left of the Hubble image had the right distance and velocity to put it in the right place a billion years ago to have been the galaxy that collided with the progenitor to the bullseye galaxy to actually then create these ripples and give you this nine, possibly 10 ring galaxy system. But that's not the whole story because this discovery might also solve the mystery of low surface brightness galaxies, which in most cases are dwarf galaxies with not very many stars, but in rare cases, they are absolute giants. One of the largest known spiral galaxies is Malin 1, which is around 650,000 light years across. That's over six times the diameter of our galaxy, the Milky Way. It has a really bright central core, but then these incredibly faint spiral or ring-like structures that extend over that massive distance. And one hypothesis that's been raised to explain these massive structures that are so faint is that they are what's left over when the rings formed in a head-on collision end up 
fading over time as the stars die off. And if that's the case, then these massive low surface brightness galaxies would also have a very high gas content as well, because it got so hot in the merger and couldn't be used to make new stars. So Pasha and collaborators also grabbed data from the Alfalfa survey, a radio survey which used the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico to detect the radio emission from hydrogen gas in galaxies to measure how much gas was present. And it turns out that the bullseye galaxy has more gas than typical spirals, similar to low surface brightness galaxies like Marlin 1. Combine that with the fact that the bullseye galaxy is also absolutely massive. That outer ring that was detected by the dragonfly array goes out to 250,000 light years. So that's two pieces of evidence that support this idea that these collisional ring galaxies don't last very long and eventually might become the massive low surface brightness galaxies that we see across the universe as well, leaving behind just a trace of the spectacular structure that was there before. Well, like a lot of scientific discoveries, this was found serendipitously, completely by accident. Seren did I say that right? Serendipitously. Serendipitously. That's me done. That was the last time I had to film before I go on holiday.